Hello, everyone, and welcome to our talk, Mishmesh. I'm using the service mesh to compromise Kubernetes environments. My name is Nir Ochfeld, and here with me on stage is Eli Ben Sasson. We are both security researchers from Israel, and we work for Wiz, the cloud security company. Now, you might be familiar with some of our previous uh, findings, notable cloud incidents like KSDB, Oh My God, Bing Bang, and some AI services, which we're going to talk about later on in this talk. In this talk, we are also going to talk about a quick introduction to what is a service mesh, and how attackers might abuse service mesh solutions to map internal networks, and how we did just that in Azure ML. We are also going to talk about how attackers might bypass the security rules imposed by service mesh solutions, and how we did exactly that to accept SAP AI, and we'll finish things off with some summary and takeaways. It's important to note that we're not going to show you any vulnerabilities in service mesh solutions. Rather, we're going to show you legitimate features that attackers might abuse to escalate low severity vulnerabilities to high or even critical. And with that, let's begin. A service mesh is essentially a dedicated infrastructure layer that manages the traffic between the different microservices within your cluster. Some examples include Istio, Linkerd, Cilium, and Console. There are many more service mesh solutions on the market, but these are just like honorable mentions. And these solutions are the network backbone of many production Kubernetes environments. <laughs> and quite frankly, a critical component in many of our engagements. So we figure that if we see them so often, we need to find a way to take them to our own advantage. Now, getting a bit more technical, this is like a general blueprint of how a service mesh might be implemented. Essentially, each pod has some kind of a networking middleware. And the entire post traffic is redirected to that networking middleware into the mesh. Once the traffic is in the mesh, the user is benefited from like a few improvements, like enhanced uh, observability, enhanced security in the form of mutual TLS and other features, and quite frankly, more. In, in our experience, this networking middleware is usually implemented using a networking sidecar container. Each pod spins up with another sidecar container that shares the network namespace with all of the other containers running on the pod. And using IP tables, the entire pod's traffic is redirected to that container and from there into the mesh. So now that we have like a general understanding of how service meshes might be implemented, we show you a real-life example for a major cloud provider that shows how attackers use to, can use like several tricks to abuse service mesh solutions and hack world-class production, <laughs> production environments. And we'll begin with Azure ML. For those of you who are not familiar with Azure ML, it's one of the world's leading AI services, supporting dozens of Fortune 500 companies. And it's also one of the most comprehensive AI platforms. As you can see on, on the left, <laughs> Azure ML has a bunch of features. But we are not machine learning experts, nor AI researchers. We are security researchers. And for us, each and every one of these features is just another attack surface. <laughs> it's essentially a subservice that we can attack and maybe get a glimpse on how is the infrastructure is implemented. And not too long after we started browsing the Azure ML portal, we landed on this page. Essentially, it's like a feature that allows customers to fetch remote data sets. You just supply an arbitrary URL, and in return, Azure will send a request from their servers to that remote server and preview <laughs> the response. Now, after a few minutes of playing with this feature, we actually realized that this URL is not sanitized nor validated. <laughs> Basically, introducing a server-side for, uh, request forgery vulnerability. Because this uh, server within Azure is probably in some sort of an Azure ML internal environment. And it's accessible to other servers that we are not. So what's next? We have the ability to send arbitrary HTTP requests and to get the response. What should we do? We first thought about communicating with the IMDS. Maybe this way we can get the machine's token and laterally move from there. But unfortunately, this is Azure and the Azure IMDS server requires a special header, and we don't control the request headers. 
we also figure that we are probably in some sort of a Kubernetes environment, and we should contact the Kubernetes API. So, and while we were able to communicate with the Kubernetes API, we lack the required credentials. And at this point, we're quite desperate. We had this amazing ability to send arbitrary requests, but couldn't know where to direct them. So we thought about just scanning the entire Azure ML subnet. <laughs> but which subnet? We didn't know anything about <laughs> how is, uh, this infrastructure is implemented. So we decided to scan the only IP address that we were sure to exist. <laughs> Basically, the, only, the, IP, the IP address that always exists. Any guesses? Exactly. We decided to scan the entire port range of localhost to see if we can find any neighbor technologies other the, than the vulnerable SSRF component. So we began with one, two, three, all the way up to 65,000. And after filtering, filtering out the results, we found this open port, 4191. <laughs> I can see some confused faces in the audience. We weren't familiar with that port either. It's apparently the Linkerd Citer container port. <laughs> so while we were thinking that we are communicating with the vulnerable component, we are actually communicating with its sidecar. So we weren't familiar with Linkerd. We dove in, delved into its uh, documentation and source code and found that the 4191 port is an actually an admin API port. We felt really optimistic. <laughs> But diving a bit further expo uh, showed us that it's actually a pretty simplistic API, exposing only three endpoints, shutdown, env, and metrics. Shutdown is quite self-explanatory. Right off the bat, we can cause some disruption on the Azure ML platform. But we are not this kind of researchers, so we began to, <laughs> we decided to move forward. Uh, envjson prints the sidecar containers in environment variables, and metrics exposes that sidecar container, Prometheus metrics. And this is an example of the environment variables. As you can see, it has like IP addresses, ports, host names, service account names, certificates, a bunch of stuff. But what was even more interesting was the metrics endpoint. Usually metrics endpoints are quite useless, but in this case it was <laughs> quite uh, like, <laughs> gave like a lot of information including IP addresses, internal IP addresses, host names and ports, service account names, and batch of information. And it also answered the question of which subnet should we scan. So these are like a, a quick recap of our findings of the Linkerd Sidecar container. We can cause a denial of service, we can print environment variables, and we can map internal hosts and ports using the metrics endpoint. And, but to this point, we only researched a very small portion of Linkerd. Linkerd also have a, a very robust control plane with a bunch of APIs. One of them is the destination API. This is essentially the API that the proxy queries before it redirects the request to the destination. So after a few, <laughs> couple of moments of uh, reading the Linkerd source code, getting familiar with its protocol bindings, we landed on something like this the ability to manually query the destination API with every service URL that we want. And this was done in our own mock environment that we set it up using the Linkerd intro tutorial. And querying one of the services, he did something that looks like this, HTTP endpoints. So while it doesn't seem like a lot, after all, it's just an HTTP endpoint, the amount of time that we, as security researchers, were in an engagement found some random HTTP server, but couldn't tell how to communicate with it. It's like countless, countless of times. But when we did manage to understand the HTTP paths or the protocol, we, ca we were able to find like significant findings. So why it sounds like security by obscurity for attackers, HTTP paths matter, matter. They're like a gold mine. So, and it's another tool in our Linkerd toolkit. We can cause a denial of service, we can extract environment variables, map internal host and ports, and now also map HTTP endpoints. But there was also one question that always bugged our mind, which is 
How does the Linkerd cycle container magically appears in every pod in a Linkerd enabled environment? So apparently, Linkerd uses something called admission controllers. Admission controllers are essentially plugins that intercept requests before they reach to the Kubernetes API server. This means that when you type kubectl create pod before the request reaches the Kubernetes API, it goes through a series of admission controllers. And those admission controllers can either validate, reject, and modify the resource request. And Linkerd does exactly that. It has the Linkerd proxy injector admission controller that modifies the pod spec to inject the Linkerd sidecar before, into that pod before the Kubernetes API creates it. But for us, as security researchers, this is essentially a privileged HTTP server open without any authentication. So we decided to the game. This is how like, a valid admission review to the Linkerd admission controller might look like. As you can see, we can control a bunch of parameters. We can control the kind, we can control the name, we can control the namespace, a bunch of different uh, fields. And we started our research with sending a baseline request, a valid request to the Linkerd admission controller, and observed the response. The response included uh, something that identifies our request as valid and the modified pod spec. Now that we have a baseline, we have something to work with. And we decided to play around with the different parameters. The first parameter that we decided to, that immediately looks suspicious to us, is the namespace. We wondered what would happen if we changed the namespace to a namespace that simply does not exist. For example, Jenkins. And the response from the link here, the admission controller was that the namespace Jenkins is not found. So what we have here is basically an oracle. We, as attacker, with a mere SSRF vulnerability, vulnerability, can start enumerating namespaces, and from that, deduce the underlying technologies that run on that cluster. These technologies can include CI-CD components, debugging components, and security measures. And for outside attackers, this is a very valuable information. And this is a like, small namespace wish list. <laughs> the kind of technologies that you want to see in a cluster. And with this server ability, can enumerate them. And now we have another tool in our Linkerd toolkit. Now that we have more than enough primitives from Linkerd, we decided to take one of them to the next level. And basically, map the entire Azure ML internal network. Basically, we decided to scan them all. And this is how we went about it. We decided, we started with communicating with the SSRF endpoints linker the instance to its metrics endpoint. And in return, we got a bunch of IP addresses, host names, and ports. We then took each and every one of these IP addresses and contacted its metrics endpoint. And in return, we got more IP addresses, more host names, more ports. We did that again and again, until eventually we got something like this. A full network map of the internal Azure ML network, including the most connected servers, which might be the, more, the most important ones, and the most neglected servers, which might have not have the best kind of security. In total, we scanned more than 1,800 IP addresses and found more than 80 unique open ports and gained an unauthorized and unauthenticated access to Prometheus, debugging tools like Goldpinger, Nginx Ingress Controller, Secret Store Metrics, and other internal Azure stuff. So with this level of access in our hands, and let me remind you, all of this using only an SSRF vulnerability. We decided to report all of the issues to Microsoft, which concluded with four bugs. We found the regular research and collaborated together to help them fix the bugs. And I also want to take a moment to thank the Microsoft team to being super professional and su super quick and responsive on this case. And as always, it was a pleasure to work with them. So 
to sum up Linkerd, we think Linkerd is a very well built and a very secure mesh solution. And we can also see them striving towards mitigating attacks like this. For example, the shutdown endpoint was disabled shortly after this, re uh, this research. It was actually reported by another researcher, but it was nice, nice to see. But even with this like production level uh, kind of solutions, before introducing any solution into a Kubernetes, Kubernetes environment, it's important to understand its potential attack surface and reconnaissance opportunities. Because as you has you seen in this case, an attacker with a mere SSRF vulnerability can escalate to a full blown network map. And with that, I want to invite my very good friend and colleague, Eli, to walk you through how we hacked SAP AI. Thank you, Neil. So uh, after we saw how we were able to abuse Linkerd in order to hack Azure ML, let's talk about how we were able to abuse Istio, bypass the rules that Istio limited us with, and utilize this to hack SAP's AI service. Let's begin. Okay, so when I said the name SAP, I think most of you are probably imagining uh, SAP's <laughs> flagship product, the SAP ERP system. You're imagining all these like crazy dashboards with graphs and charts and business data. Uh, but the truth is SAP today is more than that. They're a cloud company with a large suite of different cloud services and then AI service as well, uh, which looks actually kind of the same. <laughs> but this service called SAP AI Core uh, allows users to do lots of different uh, operations relating to AI and machine learning, uh, like running AI models, running AI, <coughs> running AI applications, and even training AI models. Now, the latter one sounded really compelling to us. We wanted to know how exactly do you train AI models on SAP? So the way that it works uh, at the end of the day is it's an Argo workflows uh, environment. You provide uh, an Argo configuration file, like the one you see here as a screenshot. You basically press enter and you're good to go. Uh, you just run uh, arbitrary Argo uh, configurations. Uh, if we take a look, a closer look at this configuration, uh, we can see that it's pretty straightforward to understand. Uh, you have, you start by declaring that this is an Argo workflow, then you define uh, the container you want to run, like what sort of container image do I want to use, what sort of flags do I want to pass to the container, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and finally, you pass the command you want to run inside the container, which is very useful for us, because that means that running our own arbitrary code on the service is not a bug, it's a feature, no vulnerability needed. So, <laughs> running our own code on SAP, uh, the question is, what's next? Uh, what do we do now? So when we led in a new environment, we want to take a little look uh, to our right or our left, try to understand uh, what sort of environment this is, and do we have any access to something that we're not supposed to have access to. So the first question is, what sort of environment are we running in? Uh, now, we're running in a Kubernetes cluster. Duh, <laughs> this is KubeCon. It would be very surprising if I wasn't talking about the Kubernetes environment, uh, but we are. Uh, and the next question we want to ask ourselves is what sort of privileges are we running in inside this container? It's very common uh, for cloud providers to give us root privileges within our own container, uh, which can be very useful for us in order to do any sort of privilege escalation tricks. However, uh, in this case, we did not run as root. We ran as a weak user, even inside our own container, the nobody user, uh, which is kind of a bummer <laughs> because it limited us from doing lots of things inside the container. Uh, but maybe we have an interesting set of Kubernetes permission. Maybe our pod is an interesting entity uh, inside the cluster and we can maybe do any sort of lateral movement path inside the cluster with our Kubernetes permissions. <laughs> However, we did not have any sort of service account, uh, no identity, no token, nothing. So we look at this sort of starting picture and we realize that it doesn't look very good. Uh, however, it doesn't look very good for us, it looks very good for SAP. Uh, but uh, we have a very interesting advantage here up our sleeve, which we can use. We control the full configuration of our pod, like start to finish. Uh, so we can try to modify the pod, tweak the environment to fit our needs better. First order of business, Run me as root, please. However, that does not work. Whenever we try to uh, alter the configuration to make ourselves run with UID zero, with the root user ID, uh, that doesn't work. We are getting blocked and our container won't allow itself to run as root, uh, which is a bummer. But still, there are many other interesting flags that we can add to pods in Kubernetes. Like we can try to make our container a privileged container. We can mount a new network namespace, a new BID namespace, mount a new disk from the host, so many other things. <laughs> However, none of these things work. Every sort of interesting flag that we try to attach gets immediately blocked by SAP's admission controller. They have like a very uh, tight list of rules and every sort of spicy flag that we try to add to our container, the container won't allow itself to run with it. 
Uh, so it seems like our compute is very limited, which is very frustrating, but this is still Kubernetes. There's an internal mesh network ahead of us, presumably. Uh, let's try to scan the internal network like we did before and try to find interesting services inside and communicate with them. However, that also doesn't work because we're getting blocked by something. We're not really sure what exactly at this point, but we know that every single request that we try to send gets blocked. So we wanted to understand what's blocking us. Is it an EDR? Is it a firewall? Is it a bird? Is it a plane? No. <laughs> it's Istio. <laughs> Again, not very surprisingly, because they're doing the title of this talk. Uh, but in this case, it kind of acted like a quote-unquote firewall. It, SAP used it to block all the traffic that we tried to send from reaching the internal network. Uh, this bothered us, and we wanted to get rid of it. Uh, but in order to do that, uh, we first had to understand how exactly does Istio work? How the, are these limitations actually implemented behind the scenes? So this is the Istio infrastructure. It's kind of similar to the way Linkerd works. We know we have our own container. We can run our own arbitrary code inside it. We control it pretty much fully. Uh, and this container runs on a Kubernetes pod. And in addition to our container, there is an Istio sidecar container that lives in the same pod as we do. Now, whenever I try to send a request to something within the internal network, that request doesn't actually go through. The request gets to Istio, to the Istio sidecar. Then if Istio allows, Istio will send the request on its own to the Kubernetes network using its egress port, receive the response using its ingress port, and then return that response right back to us. Now, to us, this entire process was transparent. Like, we didn't even realize that Istio was standing in the middle uh, if everything works. If nothing works, then Istio will just block us, and the request won't get through. Uh, now, there's another component in this equation. Uh, it's called Istio D. That's like the centralized Istio server managing uh, all the different Istio sidecars. But at this point, I don't really care about this part of the equation. I care about this part of the equation. Why is my traffic getting redirected through Istio, and is there a way that I can not do that? Uh, so the way that this works is using a Linux feature called IP tables. <coughs> Istio sets all these IP tables rules inside your, uh, inside your Linux machine, uh, your container, uh, and basically tells uh, the Linux kernel, take all the traffic going in and out, pass it through Istio first. Then Istio can decide what to do with it. However, there was one interesting stipulation attached to each one of those rules that kind of boggled my mind when I first saw it. It's take all the traffic going in and out, except traffic coming from the user ID 1337. <laughs> now I was looking at this, kind of scratching my head. <laughs> Why is the UID leet explicitly excluded from all the traffic rules here? Uh, so I did a little digging, and apparently this is not like an SAP-specific configuration. This is the way Istio works. Uh, 1337 is Istio's own user ID, and this is the way that they ensure that Istio won't be bound by Istio's rules. Like, this is how they prevent like, an infinite loop. But I was looking at this thinking, okay, I guess that makes sense, but still, <laughs> if I'm reading this correctly, it means that anyone with the user ID lead will be completely excluded from any traffic rules enforced by Istio. So I went back to the, to the drawing board, to the uh, uh, Argo configuration, and I said, okay, I know that if I set my UD to zero, if I try to be root, I will be blocked by uh, the admission controller. However, why don't I try to set my UID to 1337 instead and see what happens? So first of all, this worked. <laughs> SAP's admission controller didn't care that I set my UID to 1337, which was already a great start. Uh, and now I was running as 1337, and I wanted to test my new, privilege, my new privileges out. So this is how it uh, turned out. At first, when I was the nobody user, as you can see in the screenshot, and I tried to send a request to literally anything uh, inside the internal network, I immediately got a bad get to response, not from the resource that I was trying to access, but from Istio. Istio never actually sent my request all the way through. However, when I change my UID to 1337, and I execute the exact same request again, suddenly I get a 200 okay response. My request went through, and it seems like I now have unrestricted access to this cluster's internal network. Amazing. Now what? So normally, I would maybe say, Let's try to scan the internal network. Let's uh, fire up Nmap, try to scan whatever we can, we can find, and maybe we'll find something interesting to communicate with. But this time, we didn't actually have to do that. We have an amazing cheat code up our sleeve that we can utilize, and we will utilize. So this is another configuration uh, that SAP's mission controller failed to block. This configuration is called share process namespace, and as the name implies, it allows you to share the process namespace with everything, uh, all the containers running inside your pod. In our case, that means sharing the namespace with Istio. So this is yet another great configuration that we can add to our uh, configuration file. 
Once you were sharing our process namespace with Istio, you were able to gain access to Istio's file system. Inside the file system, we found this file, Istio token, uh, which is a very useful file because I can now take this Istio token and communicate with the Istio D centralized server. <laughs> Just think that five minutes ago, I couldn't even reach the Istio D server in the internal network, and even if, even if I did, I couldn't authenticate to it. Now I can both reach it on the internal network and I have uh, authenticated access to it and it's many useful APIs, like this API uh, on port 15014. It's the debug API of Istio D and it has a lot of endpoints. I mean, a lot <laughs> of different endpoints containing lots of different useful information. Uh, this endpoint, for example, uh, slash debug slash caches, basically provides you with a list of all of Istio's rules. You can very clearly see what the rules mean. Like, this is an outbound rule, uh, outbound rule for traffic on this host and this port. So, to the administrators, this is a list of rules, but to me, this is a list of thousands of hosts and ports which exist in the network. I don't even have to scan for them. I just have a list of all the hosts and ports in the network that I can just go and check. So, amazing. Uh, quick recap of what we did. Instead of just uh, running Nmap and basically spamming the internal network until we maybe find something, we just queried the Istio D server using our newfound access token. We took a look at all of Istio's rules and we basically found a list of thousands of hosts and ports that we can scan, we can check. So this is exactly what we did. Uh, and that's what we found. We started out uh, as attackers uh, with legitimate access to the uh, AI workflows engine, the Argo engine. This entire activity happened inside a quote unquote DMZ, like an enclosed network that didn't have any access to anything internal. Once we were able to break out of that jail uh, using our Istio bypass, we gained access to the cluster's internal network. Uh, while inside there, we found an exposed uh, instance of Grafana Loki, which gave us access to huge troves of internal customer logs from SAP customers. We then found a bunch of exposed AWS EFS file shares, which gave us access to terabytes of private customers models, uh, data sets, source code, and basically all the private files that were stored uh, inside that service. And finally, we found an exposed Helm server, a Tiller server, uh, for those who are familiar. Now this server gave us an insane level of access in this cluster. It gave us admin access to SAP's artifactory server, admin access to SAP's Docker container registries, and cluster admin privileges on the entire Kubernetes cluster of the service, giving us access to read, write, and modify anything going on in SAP AI, and also giving us access to customer credentials and customer data. <laughs> so, <laughs> Of course, we reported all these issues to uh, SAP as soon as we found them, and uh, we collaborated closely with the SAP security team uh, to help fix these bugs as much as we can. We actually went through like several iterations of fixes until we were able to really be sure uh, that uh, these attacks won't be able to be replicated again. Uh, so shout out to uh, the SAP security team and development team. Uh, maybe some of you are on here. I saw there's a, there's a booth going on. Uh, so thank you. Uh, you guys were great to work with. And of course, all the secrets that we have been able to access have been rotated since, so you don't have to worry about that. Uh, if you want to read more about this particular research, because this is seriously just the tip of the iceberg uh, of what we did, uh, you can take a look at our, our blog that we wrote about this. Uh, there's like a URL, either visit this URL or this QR code. Uh, we call this uh, SA phone. <laughs> uh, so you're welcome to uh, learn more about that in our blog. Uh, in terms of parallels to uh, Linkerd, as we said, uh, the architecture is very similar between the two services. Uh, and Linkerd also works in the exact same sort of architecture. You have uh, the sidecar container, and you have IP tables rules redirecting everything to there. Uh, and one of those IP tables rules in Linkerd is called ignore proxy UID. As the name implies, it ignores any traffic coming from the proxy UID. Uh, in this case, it's 2102. That's like the Linkerd equivalent to uh, Istio's 1337. And once again, if you're able to have that user ID, you will be exempt from all the IP tables rules and go directly into the network. So these were two uh, like real life case studies. Uh, for today. Now, uh, let's sum things up uh, with some takeaways on how to uh, secure service mesh environments. So, first of all, to sum up, uh, observability features, like the many observability features we've seen here today, are very valuable components in Kubernetes environments. That's why they're <laughs> attached to virtually every single Kubernetes component in existence. However, it's very clear to everyone who designed these features that they should be accessible from trusted environments only. They were all made with trusted environments in mind, and once attackers are able to like breach this trust to gain access to these environments, then they can basically abuse these legitimate features to do things like reconnaissance, like, uh, <coughs> like lateral movement, like privilege escalation, uh, and all the other sort of things we've seen here today. 
Uh, now, this is not a problem that's limited to Linkerd and Istio only. It's actually pretty standard in uh, Kubernetes components to have these sort of uh, observability features accessible without authentication, uh, assuming that these environments are trusted. Uh, so when they're not, then this can introduce all the risks we've seen here today. Uh, in terms of the takeaways that we want you to like, leave with here today, uh, we would recommend, first of all, to assess any new Kubernetes component that you add to your environment with an offensive outlook. Meaning, in addition to looking at a tool and thinking, like, what sort of tools does this give me uh, to administer the cluster, uh, also think what sort of attack surface does this tool introduce to my environment. Uh, like, in the Linkerd example we've seen today, you have the admission controller component, uh, which in addition to its many legitimate usages, can also be abused to enumerate namespaces. Uh, the destination API component uh, enables attackers to map HTTP endpoints in uh, APIs in the cluster. Uh, the sidecar admin API allows attackers to map your network and to disclose environment variables. So these sort of risks should be considered when building a defense network using this service. Uh, the second takeaway is that you should always properly segment your Kubernetes networks uh, with <laughs> Specific, specifically, uh, the separate between anything that's considered data plane, where all your workloads run, and the control plane, where all the important management infrastructure lives. Uh, with a strong emphasis on, obviously, customer-facing environments, like well, the ones we've seen here today, some of which literally allow customers to run their own arbitrary code. These sort of environments should always be very strongly separated from everything that can be considered a uh, control plane. Uh, and we would advise, if you have very critical access rules, to, uh, to also enforce them in the Kubernetes level as an additional safeguard uh, to setting them in the service mesh. Uh, and the third and final takeaway that we want you to leave with here, uh, <coughs> to leave this talk with, is that you should always use multiple security barriers when you're trying to separate between different sorts of environments. Like, these, very, uh, these barriers can come in many different uh, like shapes and forms. It can be compute-related barriers, like uh, containerization, like virtualization, and even separation of uh, physical server separation if you're really uh, paranoid, if you really want to separate strongly. Uh, it can be a network-related barriers, like uh, firewall solutions, like service mesh, uh, and even segmentation the network hardware. And it can also be uh, barriers relating to authentication and authorization, like uh, uses, uses of secrets, identities, tokens, passwords, uh, mutual TLS, and any other form of authenticated between different uh, services. Uh, we think that it's always correct to assume that the first line of defense will eventually be bypassed. Like in our cases today, the first line of defense was a very strong one. Like Linkerd and Istio uh, basically uh, didn't enable us to do anything interesting. But once we were able to bypass that first obstacle, it seemed like the rest of the obstacle weren't as strong as the first one. So I think we should always uh, assume that the first line of defense will eventually be breached and that to make sure that it would never be the sole security barrier standing between an attacker and sensitive infrastructure. Uh, if it will be, then we'll be able to enable attacks like the one we see here today. Thank you very much. Uh, if there are any questions, uh, you're welcome to step up to the microphones. Uh, and yeah, thank you.